I'm obviously delighted to be here. I cannot believe how much time has passed and so quickly. I mean, it's a little frightening, but that's for another talk. Uh, so, uh, Ned invited me to give an academic talk, which I feel, given where we have gone this morning, feel a little uh, uncomfortable about. Uh, so, uh, you, I just have to assert that what I'm going to talk about actually does have implications for climate change, for future of economic policy, and for the rest of it. The talk I will give is a talk that deals with the most fundamental issue of economic theory, namely how economists should think about the future. So my claim is that uh, the, the conference had, a, thank God, a subtitle, Economics for the Future. So my claim is that economics should be for the future that is open. And I'm going to make that clear as to what it means that the future is open. How does that differ from the economics that uh, we practice? The economics that we practice is the economics in which the, in which the future is closed. It so happens that this year also marks the centennial of the publication of Frank Knight's book, who advanced the distinction between risk and true uncertainty. True uncertainty is uncertainty that cannot be characterized with probabilistic rules. Knight's profound insight was that this uncertainty arises precisely for what Karl Popper aptly called the future that is objectively open. The future is both open by our actions, by exogenous events, and of course we live now in a world in which after COVID and with climate change, the future is intrinsically open. So it seems self-evident that that's what economists should try to do. Yet, economists have resisted opening their models to change that is not described in such rigid probabilistic terms. What I mean is something very simple. Economists think of the economy as being a toss of, repeated toss of a coin. Of course, people who are technical economists here would object, but nonetheless, that analogy is almost exact. There could be a more complicated stochastic process or probabilistic process, but ultimately it's tossing the, the coin. And the explanations that economists have been seeking for economic phenomenon is the explanations that assume that the future is the uh, probabilistic replica of the past. And what I will, this is a very vast topic, I've written long pages on this, I'll just focus on something very, very specific. I apologize for being much more narrow than the previous speakers. I goes against my tendency, but that's, that's where I am. Ned put me in that position, and I appreciate his license to do that. So I just want to acknowledge that the center was the first place that gave Michael Gobe and I an institutional home to pursue these ideas, and of course, the. INET, Institute for New Economic Thinking, provided both general support and real strong encouragement to examining this, what could be called an out-of-the-box issue. And what our program has shown is that it is possible to do economics, although we are in a preliminary stage, I wish more people did that. It's possible to do economics, it's possible to actually model things mathematically, despite the expressions of doubt about that that have been prominent even in the, with the earlier speaker, but that requires a new way of thinking about it. And what I, my comment, my general comment about current economics is the great success of economies was that uh, our, that uh, Rana in her really excellent speech was convinced that what economies, what we need to leave, we need to leave of the world of rationality. And my argument is the exact opposite. We have to leave the argument that economists have defined as rationality. So what economists call rationality is actually not rationality. And that's what explains why they think that politics and psychology and all of this are symptoms of irrational behavior. So that's the bottom line of what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to be much more specific in what I'll talk about. So a case in point that I will take is 
the development of macroeconomic theory since the 1970s. So it's a big topic. I have another 15 minutes, so I'll have to be a little superficial. <laughs> okay, so this development in macroeconomic theory since 1970s can all be thought as an attempt to implement the book that Jeff Sachs put on the blackboard on the, on the, on the screen when he started to implement the micro foundations program. So in discussing the vision for the program, and that's the key, it's my favorite phrase since I, since I came to the United States, I tried to read Harold Pinter, found it difficult, and all my senior thesis in college, I was a physics uh, uh, student on Pinter, so this has always been my favorite quote in the economics literature. I, isolated and apprehensive, these Pinteresque figures construct expectations of the state economy and maximize relatively to that imagined world. So I view the development of macroeconomics since the 1970s to be an attempt to implement this idea, and I will argue that that attempt has failed precisely because economists have decided that they, uh, consensually decided that they, will, that they can know so much about the future as to be able to describe it in exact probabilistic terms. And that's basically the, if I don't get there, that's the bottom line, okay? So the first attempt to do that was to ask the question, what does it mean that economists, that participants maximize subject to their world? The favorite whipping point of economists is that they talk about people maximizing and that is this rationality and we have to abandon it. The problem, of course, is that it's not clear what rationality means. So the first attempt to describe this rational behavior was to say that the world that, the con that this Pinterest figures imagine is the world in which they simply do error correcting. They see an error in the inflation rate, they fix it by a fixed amount. That uh, uh, simple device, together with maximization, led to a radical reinterpretation of economic policy. It led, to the, it led to the idea that there is a, the economy converges to the natural rate, that the, 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 the led to a supposed explanation why the trade-off between inflation and unemployment is unstable, because it disappears in the long run, not for other reasons, and revolutionized macroeconomic policy to this day, actually. And all the major models that the central banks use are essentially based on the simple ideas that were there. So what was the problem with this idea? The problem with this idea is that people who simply correct errors are not rational in a normal sense. Rational person is a person who has some understanding of the world, as Ned put it, imagine world, and maximizes subject to that world. Something an error correcting rule, like the one that I had on a previous slide, of course, has no relation to the way the world works. Example, if we have a world of accelerating inflation, using a fixed rule to adopt the inflation would be utterly irrational, because one would want to change the adaptation. Interestingly enough, I've gone through some evolution in my own research <laughs> as the center was progressing, I used to think that I didn't understand how profound Bob, uh, Jack Muth's contribution was that laid foundations to rational expectations. Muth had argued, Muth had recognized that economists really don't know what rationality is. They simply do not, cannot understand it because they do not know what it means that somebody maximizes relatively to their expectation of the world as he put it, there are many ways to understand the world. So what did he propose? He proposed something phenomenally radical, which took Ned and me about quite some time to try to destroy, and which I come to now understand actually should not be destroyed. He argued that an economist can relate market participants' forecast to rational considerations by specifying what they think to be consistent with the economist model. This sounds super crazy, so let me just make it less crazy. So Muth's idea was that when an economist constructs a model, that model basically represents some rational considerations about how the world works. If it doesn't, the model should be thrown out 
goodbye. So the basic premise of any model is that it represents some rational considerations. So since we do not know how individuals think about the future, we can relate what they do to rational considerations by supposing that it's consistent with what we ourselves believe. That's the only position that we can take. Bob Lucas later argued that that's the only coherent way to do macroeconomic models. That was his argument. Now, what happened here? Why did this all, the whole thing went wrong? Or it went wrong exactly in the place where I want to focus on. So first, let me, uh, let me mention what the implication. So it went wrong in the following assumption. Muth implemented this hypothesis in a, in, a, in a model in which the world in, evolves according to a probabilistic rule. His hypothesis had nothing to do with this. He just made an implementation of that kind. That implementation has far-reaching implications. If the world evolves according to what economists assume is one probabilistic rule, then there's only one rational way to think about the world. <laughs> is according to that rule. And the rest is history. The rest is called efficient market hypothesis. It's called deregulation. It's called all of these things that we know very well from history. All of these things that supposedly have rational foundations. And that, and Yuck has a really strong view on actually the government policy as well. And of course, all of this has nothing to do with rational foundations. It has to do with an assumption that nothing genuinely new ever happens. That's what the assumption, the assumption that the, world, the future is described by a probabilistic rule is an assumption that if I'm at, in 1970s, I can predict that there's going to be an iPhone and you can even put a probability on it. It's enough to say that Events like this happen every day, actually. I've just written a paper which demonstrates that during the 2020 pandemic year, every day there was an event like this on which we couldn't put the probability on it. Every single day. So this, of course, killed uh, Phelps's idea. Why did it kill that idea? Because if the only one way to think about the future is the way economists think about the future. And of course, participants' autonomous expectations play no role. <laughs> the economist dictates what the individual autonomy means, precisely. Then this model has experienced difficulties. So the next phase in this saga has been that Bob Schiller in a pod break showed that they simply, that this kind of explanation simply fails to explain asset prices completely. So then there were two options. One is to abandon the idea that economists can describe the world so precisely. Another one is to say that there's something else that matters. Or that something else looked very plausible. Of course, people are emotional as we heard. They care and they're human and all that stuff. So what's the answer? The answer is, that they, the psychological influences is what matters. But because the world was described in such rigid terms, the only way to understand why they do that is to think of psychological as irrationality. So that's, that was the reason why I commented, or Rana's uh, comment, that we have to leave the world of rational men. We have to leave the world of rational men as described by economists. That we definitely have to leave. And then, it, then psychology will come in. I already commented that this idea that when you write down the model, you basically, uh, you basically hypothesize that that's how the world works, that if you are coherent, forget consistency, then you shouldn't be thinking that what the people that you describe, that your model supposedly describe, think otherwise, it makes no sense. So, Muth's hypothesis appears as the principle of coherent model building. Now, here's now a logical dilemma. If you get away from, if you assume that economies can precisely characterize how the world works, then you only have two options. One, you can think that people are mechanically rational in the way in which they, according to the economist's view of the world, or people are irrational 
And those two views lead to dramatically different implications for the market and the state that I am not going to discuss here because we don't have the time for it. So I've recently written a paper with uh, a student of mine which argues that market, not surprisingly, so if you take that view, if you really think that the fact that we do not know exactly how the future will unfold is the problem with economics, which is my assertion, then what would you expect? You would expect that market participants neither commit predictable errors, namely they neither commit, conform to behavioral theory nor to the REH theory. That's what you would expect, because the reason is somewhere else. The new data, which is the data on expectations, allows actually to test this hypothesis directly. And in a macro variable, which is the most important for policy, namely inflation, I can report to you that not one behavioral model that has been proposed in the last 50 years, and not, only, and not, on, not one rational expectations model that has been proposed in the last 50 years actually survives the data. And there is, I at least, I mean, the paper is with the journal. I don't know how the referees would like that. That would, I'm, I'm not holding my breath. But I'm looking forward to actually seeing how they're going to counter this. So what's the way forward? So the, the way forward, and I have three and a half minutes, so I can. So the way forward is to now acknowledge what economists have, didn't want to acknowledge, that there's a limit to what we can know about the future. Uh, Rana had asked me over lunch, why hasn't that such an obvious statement yet been acknowledged? That's an, uh, you know, if I mention this to somebody who is not an economist, that that's what I work on, and they said, oh, that's a very interesting research project. Is that really a research project? <laughs> so uh, it is a research project because the, the economists have basically refused to acknowledge that, no matter what they do, on a micro or macro level. So the question is, can this be done? So what this can, this can be done if we acknowledge that we cannot know precisely what the future holds, and I, and of, of course, I'm not going to now uh, in a 15 minute talk to say how that can be done, but what is interesting about it intuitively can be delivered in two minutes. Once you acknowledge that you do not know exactly how the world is going to work, your view of climate change, your view of COVID, your view of macroeconomic policy, all of it changes, all of it. I, the little I know now, I know that your view of how the stock prices uh, uh, unfold over time changes completely. That I already know because the paper is almost finished. But I already know that the macro views will also change, the macro policy view. And then what will come back? What will come back is once we do not know precisely how the world works, we don't know precisely how individuals make optimal decisions. And once we do not know precisely how individuals make optimal decisions, you, they, their autonomous decisions, as Ned put it, can actually play a role. So the question is, how do we model this in such a way as to have some handle on some bounds within which they make decisions, yet without being precise about the, the exact decisions that they make? And that is now appears to be possible. Once we pass that bridge, then we, it's clear that we can bring in psychology back into rationality, as Keynes argued. Keynes actually was the one who argued, who is always considered to be a, pre, a, a predecessor of behavioral economics, that psychology is part of by behavioral economists. Uh, that rationality, that psychology is part of rationality. It's a very famous claim that if we don't know the future precisely, what are we going to rely on? Is market sentiment, psychology, and all these things. The question is how to put this in a model. And then the models will also reflect political realities. They will have contingencies. There's one thing we're going to lose. We're going to lose the claim that we can predict the future exactly. And I am not sure that my colleagues would go along with admitting that. But once we did that, I think we can actually be optimistic about what Ned put in a subtitle, the economics of the future, the future that is genuinely open. Thank you. We 
could take a few questions if, if there are any. a lot. Does anyone else have a question? All right. Kind of a small point, an historical point, but uh, I'm struck that uh, uh, the Nike uncertainty can also, can it also be called Humean uncertainty because this is exactly what David Hume argued in the 18th century and also in my perspective, it's very Popperian, uh, Karl Popper's uh, criticisms. And so I just wonder if you make any of these connections because it just jumps right out at me as you're talking about this, that, yeah, this is what I teach my students about Hume and, and the problem of induction. So the, 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 the difference between Knight and Hume, the way I understand it, but you will correct me, is that Knight had one extremely important point, which Keynes had later, much later, but Knight had it very articulated, that the reason there is this uncertainty is that the change is unforeseeable, that the change cannot be described in a probabilistic terms. The, it's not a question of induction. It is a question of, it connects with induction because what that says is that based on past data, I cannot know exactly what will happen in the future. So in this sense, it connects with induction. But, and that's exactly what the challenge is for economists is that there needs to be a connection between the past and the future, but cannot be a replica of the past. As far as Popper is concerned, or Popper's poverty of historicism, which Popper does not give credit to Knight, is direct Knight. <laughs> Popper is direct Knight. Pop basically says that the reason that you have, you need an open society is because you basically have, in Knightian words, unforeseeable change. In fact, the most famous quote for me from Popper is that the future is open. And then he adds, it's very important, it is objectively open. But what does that mean that something is objectively open? It's objectively open because it cannot be described in exact objective terms, like probabilistic terms. And that's, so that to me is that that connection is exact. There's also a connection with Hayek. There's also obviously a connection with Hayek who, be, who also believe, you know, believe that he prefers the exact in the imperfect knowledge that is likely to be true to the pretense of the, of the exact knowledge that is likely to be false. That, has, that lesson has not been absorbed yet. So, yes, all of this, yes, I do make those connections. In fact, in a paper I'm writing, I want to bring in Keynes and Knight together because Keynes had a very important contribution that Knight certainly didn't have. Nate, Keynes understood that psychology is part of rationality. That was an extremely important insight that has been completely, totally brushed away and that Knight, of course, had no inkling of, you know, so, yes. Bill. Bill? Whoever, yeah. Oh, we'll do you and then your, yeah, okay, here, no, Alfredo, you go ahead. And then we'll yeah. Next. <laughs> okay, thank you. I just want to ask you, you cannot, what you're telling us is that you cannot put a probabilistic uh, value on the unexpected? The probabilistic value on an unexpected. Yes. But that's, the, but that's, where, that's where it cuts. If you believe you can put a probabilistic value on unexpected, that means there's no unexpected. And that, uh, because, let me just give you a, a, a semi-mathematical example. If you think that the future is just two values, plus one and minus one, like he's tossing a coin. And if you're the, and each one is a probability of a half, okay? So if your decision depends on the expected value, which is the way economists model it, then of course, the fact that there are two values doesn't matter because the expected value is a number. So anytime you describe the future probabilistically, you basically bring the system down to the deterministic system. Um, Samuelson, by the way, when he proposed the efficient market hypothesis in his famous Bell paper, had a complete understanding of this point. And actually asked at the end of the paper that nobody reads because we've run away with the perfect arbitrage conditions. He says, but you know, is this real what I wrote here? 
Is this about the wealth? But what is this probability? And, and where does it come from? How do the market participants come to an agreement as to what that probability is? And the rest of it. He, he was the one who had huge doubts about whether this describes anything. And look how far we've gone with it. We've basically, I know arguably, some people will argue that that's not the case. This, we had a democratic and republican administration operate on the basis of the theory that any degree of, of, interve of government intervention in financial markets is going to make these markets less efficient. And that question only arose after we basically nearly collapsed. And then what was our answer? That's the important point. Our answer was that that has to do with psychology. In a recent book by Andrei Schleifer and, 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 and Gerioli, they say that 2008 crisis was a crisis of beliefs. There was a crisis of beliefs, mainly that people make systematic mistakes because they're crazy. And that's why we had a financial crisis. The incredible thing about this, my wife doesn't like me to make that connection, that I want you to guess who made the first endorsement of the book. The top endorsement of the book is by no less but Janet Yellen, who says that this is a new way to do economic policy. We're going to base it on system, I quote, we're going to base it on systematic mistakes by financial market participants. Compare this with, say, the view of Bill's view, Bill Janeway's view, who argues that you need a government to bring people up to do things on which they, many of them will make mistakes, and these mistakes are not systematic, and they need the markets to actually propel this forward. That's a completely, radically different view of the world. Roman, just a, a footnote to what you said about Keynes. As you know, it was his interaction with Ramsey that proved enormously productive and led him from the treatise on probability to how he treats it in the general theory. And Ramsey really brings in the, the notion of degree of belief. You know, it, it, you, yes. it, it, you, you have some probability that it might rain, but the question is, do you take an umbrella or not? That's the only way you can get to uh, uh, some kind of decision. Uh, I, I, I agree with that, but uh, this is correct. This, I think, on the level of individual decision maker, I completely agree with. What I was talking about is how can you construct a theory based on that idea? And the theory-based idea has to say how you form the probability that it's going to rain and the rest of it. Yes, Rob. And do just one more. I find myself coming here after being upstairs and talking about demagoguery or democracy and policy. And why I think your work is so important, Roman, is when economists pretend with quantitative tools that they're doing analysis, that's scientism, that's not scientific. And they become discredited as experts, and this is at a time when we need to really rejuvenate the credibility of expertise. And what I like most about your work is how you're exploring with data, and I know David Hendry has done some work like that at Oxford, whether these models can explain things. And it doesn't appear that they, that they can, that these arbitrary assumptions of assigning a probability are false certainty. And I think that's very dangerous in the political climate in which we now live. In fact, they are mathematically, they're false certainty when it comes to understanding the world. And as I try to explain with the Contos example, their exact certainty when it comes to their formal representation. If you say something is represented by probability, but your decision depends on the mean of that probability, that's not any different than you thinking that you make decisions based on deterministic number. This, by the way, is a very, there's a broader thing that I want to link to Rana's important point. You see, people like her think that economists basically think humans are numbers, and can you put these things into numbers? And all of this has to do with this obsession of being able to predict the future exactly. Once we get rid of it, we'll have qualitative, other fields will come into our understanding, like psychology, like politics, and we will have predictable, uh, we'll have predictions that we can test. So I think that we, 
we need to acknowledge the obvious. And actually, I, I don't know how many times this can be said. For some reason, acknowledging the obvious has been really difficult. And the reason for that is very, very multifaceted. You know, how people agree to believe to something like this, who are intelligent and very smart, is not an easy thing to understand. I tried to do that for as long as the center exists. But one clear answer is actually the one that Rob gave. What a great pleasure in being able to say exactly what will happen. What a comfort that that is.